What's more important than designing great products? I'll give you a hint. It's not winning fancy design awards. It's not getting a bunch of likes on Dribble. The thing that's more important than designing great products is delivering great products, shipping great products. We make it a lot harder to deliver great products when we're one of those asshole designers that everybody hates. So how do we deliver great products? We'll stick around and we'll break it down. What's up, UX fam? How's your mom and them? Welcome to another episode of Beyond UX Design. I'm Jeremy. If you're new here, welcome to the show. I'm super stoked you're here. If you haven't done it already, consider liking or subscribing or following the show wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you are regular here and you feel like you're getting something out of the show, as always, I would really appreciate you leaving a five-star review. That'll help me out way more than you can imagine. And of course, if you think the show is worth sharing, I'd love it if you told some of your friends. Here's the thing about software. It's generally pretty straightforward. You type the right string of characters in your IDE and out comes the software. Assuming you typed it all correctly and you referenced all the right functions and there's no typos, well, not much should go wrong. So what makes software hard? It's the people. Now, I know software isn't technically easy. I don't want to diminish the work of all you brilliant software engineers out there, but I think most engineers would probably agree with this point at least that people make the already difficult job of building great software even more difficult. And I would argue more difficult than it often has to be. Now, unfortunately for us UX designers, we need all those people. Those people take our fancy, well-thought-out, well-researched, well-tested designs, and they help us get those pretty pictures turned into working software. And whether it's product teams helping to move the process along, scrum masters removing blockers for engineers, or engineers typing all that stuff that they type, we need them. I know, it's heartbreaking. And look, the fact is that if you aren't the only person on the team, then you need everyone on the team. And your relationship with those people will directly impact your ability to get the end users the software that they need to solve their problems and improve their day. So let me ask you a question. Are you constantly fighting with your engineering or product teams? Do you feel like you're constantly getting left out of conversations that you belong in? Do you feel like your team doesn't trust you when you do get a chance to speak up? If you said yes to any of these, then there's a good chance your relationship with your team isn't all that hot. And if it's not all that hot, well, you probably already know what that means. So let me give you a quick story. Let me tell you a little story about Jan. Jan has a debilitating disease. Jan uses two different apps to track her condition. And Jan just wants an app that's easy to use. She's already got a lot in her mind. She doesn't need to worry about the software too. I want you to meet Fred. Now, Fred is a talented designer. Fred designs healthcare software. Fred is passionate about design. Fred designs one of those apps that Jan uses. Fred has all the answers. And Fred makes sure everybody on his team knows that he is the designer. Fred is difficult to work with. Now, I want you to meet Amy. Amy is also a talented designer. Amy also designs healthcare software. Amy's also passionate about design. Amy designs the other app that Jan uses. But Amy knows she doesn't have all the answers, so Amy encourages collaboration, and Amy gets along well with her team. Fred is constantly butting heads with his coworkers, and they've started to leave him out of important conversations. They've stopped asking Fred for his opinion, and they think Fred's kind of a jerk. And unfortunately for Fred, he's losing a seat at the table. Fred has some really brilliant ideas, but Fred can't seem to ship valuable features. Now, Amy makes it easy for her coworkers to work with her. And they always include her in important conversations. They always get her opinion first. And they think Amy's great. And Amy has a seat at the table. And Amy has some really brilliant ideas. And somehow Amy is easily able to ship all those valuable features. Now, Amy and Fred have the same hard skills, but very different soft skills. And Fred and Amy are both great designers. Fred always seems to be left out of the important meetings. Fred can't influence his team. He's ended up having very little impact on the final product after his handoffs. And Amy is able to influence her team. She has a much larger impact on the final product. So what made Fred and Amy so different? Amy fostered empathy. She had regular one-on-ones. She didn't skip the small talk. She paid attention. Amy got to know her team. Fred fostered apathy. He skipped those one-on-ones. 
He jumped right into meetings. He multitasked during meetings. He didn't care about his team. Amy fostered collaboration. She knew she didn't have all the answers. She didn't lead with no. She shared credit with her team. Amy was a team player. Fred fostered division. He thought he had all the answers. He shot down ideas. He took all the credit. He didn't play well with others. Amy fostered communication. She was clear. She was concise. She didn't use buzzwords and acronyms. She asked questions, and she listened. And Amy had an open-door policy. Fred fostered silence. He talked in circles. He used big, fancy UX words his team didn't understand. He talked over everybody. Fred was a know-it-all. Amy fostered agility. She picked her battles. She was willing to change her process. She worked closely with her engineers. Amy didn't let perfect get in the way of the good enough. Fred fostered stagnation. He fought everybody on pixel perfection. He was rigid. He was inflexible. He passed spec sheets over the fence and expected his engineers to follow them perfectly. Fred couldn't see the bigger picture. Amy fostered trust. She delivered her work on time. She set the right expectations. She took responsibility. Amy had integrity. And Fred fostered doubt. He delivered work on his time. He took on work he knew he couldn't finish. He shifted the blame. And Fred's team couldn't count on him. Amy fostered UX literacy. She didn't work in a silo. She included everybody in her UX activities. She constantly shared her findings. Amy showed the value of UX. Fred fostered ignorance. He worked in his own. He kept UX activities to the UX team. He kept his findings to himself. Fred kept UX siloed. Now, Jan just wants software that works. And Fred's app seems to have a lot of bugs. And she's not really happy with the experience. And Jan's suffering because Fred can't get along with his team. But Amy's app seems to be working just fine. She's really happy with that experience. And Jan's better off because Amy got along with her team. So this is kind of a basic example. And it's betting on the fact that the rest of your team is great, which they aren't always are. And if the rest of your team is great and you do these things that Amy did, I think you're going to be a hell of a lot further along than most people are. So this silly example was pretty basic. It touched on some of the major benefits of making sure that we're building these important relationships with our team. And one of the biggest benefits of making sure we build these relationships is that we build trust. Every good relationship is built on trust. It opens up every other benefit that we see from great relationships. When we build trust, we become a trusted partner. And it goes both ways. And when that happens, a lot of the issues that we hear from other UX professionals they talk about become less of a problem, and it leads to a lot of really great outcomes for us and for our users. First, we tend to get less pushback when we present our ideas, our designs, our thoughts, whatever. Our teams tend to include us earlier. We get included in the big picture discussions. We learn about constraints and the goals early on. We get more time to do the job right and we have an opportunity to influence early and often. We then help to build a shared understanding sooner. We help influence those decisions sooner. We get that seat at the table that we're always asking for. But the problem for a lot of us is that we do everything Amy did, and we can't deliver great products because we work with a team of frets. So how do we build relationships? What do we do when that happens? Well, here are some things that I found over the years. You can try these out and see what works for you. And note that every team is a little bit different, different personalities, different dynamics, all that stuff. So try it out, but experiment. Please experiment. See what works for you. Do more of what works, do less of what doesn't. Something I think is really important, especially early on, is getting to know everybody on your team. And this might be easier in person, but I think you can still do this remote. When you first join a team, schedule a one-on-one with everybody. So do 25 minutes so you don't take up a full half hour. It shows that you're being courteous of their time. You're being considerate. It shows that you respect them right off the bat. Spend the time getting to know them a little bit. Talk a little bit about yourself. Ask them questions, though. Don't spend the whole time talking about you. Let them talk. Find something in common to connect with them. And if they talk about their kids or their partners or their dogs, write the names down. Take notes. And you can go back and look at that later. And you'll sound way more genuine when you ask them about Timmy's big ball game instead of just your son. This will make all that small talk later a lot easier. And that small talk is really important for keeping the relationship going. It's not frivolous. You can also use this time to ask them about expectations for your role. What do they expect from people in this role? Maybe ask them how the previous person worked. Ask them how they work with the previous person. Ask if it was a good relationship. What did they do wrong? What did they do right? What can you keep doing? What do you want to change next time? You want to start this working relationship on the right foot. So set expectations early. 
Tell them what you think the role is and tell them what you expect from them. Maybe spend some time talking about the things that you expect to accomplish in the role. Talk about how you can help them and the team, how you can do something for them. And if you expect to be invited to all those different activities, it might be a good time to talk about how you should be there and what value you think you bring if you were there. Really, I think a lot of the conflicts that we have at work are due to misaligned expectations. So set those expectations now so it isn't a problem later. If you're in person, get out the office, go for a walk, go get some coffee down the block, make it enjoyable. Now, obviously, this is, this is a lot for 25 minutes, so play it by ear. Don't be afraid to schedule more time if you think you need it. Learn the language of the organization, and this is especially true if you're interacting with senior leaders like executives. Now, don't sound like a Kool-Aid drinking robot, but if they use certain terms, use the same terms too. If they say discover, you say discovery. If they say research, you say research. If they say requirements, then you say requirements. If they say business rules, you say business rules, whatever. You want to make it seem like you're part of the team and not an outsider. And I'm not saying go so far as to sound fake. So you know what's right here. Just go for that. Don't take it too far. If you're fortunate enough to work with an international team, I would definitely recommend learning a few words in their language. You don't have to be fluent, but just learning a few key phrases like, good morning, how are you? I'm sorry. That's another big one. That can go a long way. Learn some of the customs. Learn the holidays and wish them happy holiday. Don't don't bug them when they're off and when you're working just because you didn't know they were off. And maybe most importantly, be aware of time zones. Don't bug them at night, their time, just because you're still at work. So once you started to build these relationships, you need to keep them going. And one of the hardest things I've found being remote is losing all that sideline talk, that chat over the coffee machine or the break room, those random conversations that you might drop in on when you're at the office. So if you're remote, these things, I think, need to be more intentional. If you have a team that is active on something like Slack, maybe they have different channels for different interests like dogs or cats or pets or home improvement. Where I work, we have all kinds of channels, DIY landscaping, music, dogs, fishing, bikes, whatever. We even have a Slack channel where people go and talk about fast food. It's pretty awesome. Honestly, it's kind of hilarious. (laughs) Now, something a lot of people tend to overlook is the small talk And I've especially seen this since going fully remote. When we have meetings, everybody just stays quiet for the first few minutes, and then someone always just gets down to business. Don't do that. Use the time to ask how people are. Ask if they have any big plans for the weekend. Ask how their weekend was. Ask how their kids are doing. If you know their kids were sick, ask how they're feeling. You're trying to get to know them on a more personal level. Remember when you took notes and you wrote down all those names of the important people in their lives? That'll come in really handy here. These little side conversations are really important. Everybody is so worried about looking like they're working hard that we miss out on a lot of the opportunities to build strong bonds with our teams when we don't do these things. And those bonds make hard stuff later that much easier to go through. Another good opportunity for relationship building is scheduling some regular one-on-ones with all the key people on your team. And this doesn't have to be every week. It could be once a month, could be every two weeks, every three weeks, once a quarter. I think you'll know the right rhythm for your team. Just keep it consistent and remember to keep the meetings fun. Go in with the mindset that you you can help them solve a problem. Ask if you can do anything to help. This will go a long way to building trust and empathy for them. Remember, all this is not to sound fake. If you want to build genuinely strong relationships with your team, you need to be genuine. The point of all of this is to build empathy for your team. And as you as professionals, we talk all the time about empathy for users and how important empathy for users are, but we really need to build empathy for our team and understand where our team is coming from. And too often I see this othering where it ends up being UX designer versus the bad developers or the UX designer versus the bad product teams or the stakeholders or whatever it is. It's always their fault. I think that's bullshit. Sure, there are really bad engineers or really bad product people out there, but I think that's generally pretty rare. And more often, we didn't put the effort into understanding where they are coming from and really understanding why they are asking for what they're asking for. Understand what other crap they have to do outside of work. It might be stressing them out. Or what constraints are they under? What pressures are they feeling from other teams? So the last big thing that I think is worth noting is that in order for us to be trusted partners and foster collaboration, we really need to walk the walk. We need to have an open door policy that brings our team along with us. If the UX maturity on our team is low, it likely isn't because people on the team hate UX designers. 
it's most likely because they just don't know the alternatives or the culture of the company or the organization is just not what we want it to be. And it's really on us to help get them there and to build that UX literacy. So how can we do that? Well, we include them. Include your important product and engineering people in brainstorming or whiteboard sessions. Get them involved with planning research. Actually take them along when you do research. Include them in usability studies. Include them in design critiques. Let them see the process and the science behind what we do so they don't think we're just drawing pretty pictures all day. This will also go towards building the UX team up as a trusted expert and a partner. And this will go a long way towards improving how you work with your team. And everybody on the team should really feel like they own some aspect of the user experience. So let them in and see that relationship blossom. Remember, user experience is not the sole domain of the user experience design team. APIs being down, slow internet speed, bugs, all those things can affect the experience a user has. So remember, UX designers do a lot better when they work with the entire team and they aren't working alone in their corner, throwing designs over the fence and expecting the engineering team to build the pixel-perfect designs. That will likely never happen, and your users will suffer for it. Well, all right, y'all, I think that's it for me for today. I hope to help give you all a little insight into why I think relationships are so important, but what do you think? Have you used any of these tips to help build better relationships with your team? Let me know what you think. Hit me up on LinkedIn or shoot me an email at hello at beyonduxdesign.com. If you like what you heard today, don't forget, like or subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you feel like you're getting something out of the show, I would love it if you left a five-star review. That would help me out way more than you know. And if you really liked it, I mean really liked it, why don't you tell a friend? So sign up for the newsletter, check out all the past episodes at beyondUXdesign.com. And I hope you keep coming back for more great UX tips from Beyond UX Design. And until next time, remember, you're more than a designer because there's so much more to UX than design. I'll see you around. Take care, y'all.